The Kamala interview didn't go over well with Kamala stands. Big Kamala stand, but this is a terrible answer to the question the reporter asked. He asked for two specific things she will do to improve middle class economic outlook. She goes off on a tangent about her family and never answers the question, at least not for the two plus minutes in this clip. Yeah, it's not going well with Kamala stands because it's policy list. All right, let's look at it. Kamala Harris earlier today gave an interview to a... A, a singular, a single sit down interview to local, uh, local Philadelphia action news. Okay. Madam Vice President, pleasure to meet you. Thanks Good for your to time today. Mine. Our audience appreciates your time. As well. Of course. As you know, we're sitting here in a state and arguably in front of an audience that 54 days from now could decide the outcome of this presidential election. Yeah. You hear it more than I do. People want to know more about you and about your specific plans. At the debate the other night, you talked about creating an opportunity economy. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we can drill down on that a little bit. When we talk about bringing down prices and making life more affordable for people, yeah. what are one or two specific things you have in mind for that? Well, I'll start with this. Um, I grew up a middle class kid. My mother raised my sister and me. She worked very hard. Um, she was able to finally save up enough money to buy our first house when I was a teenager. Um, I grew up in a community of hardworking people, you know, construction workers and nurses and teachers. And I try to explain to some people who may not have had the same experience, you know, if, if but a lot of people will relate to this. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood of folks who were very proud of their lawn, you know. And, um, and I was raised to believe and to know that all people deserve dignity. And that we as Americans have a beautiful character. You know, we have ambitions and aspirations. This reads as like, maybe not as bad as like Hillary Clinton in general, but like too much, too much space, too much filler. This is harder than a goddamn Toei filler episode because they caught up to the original manga type. You know what I mean? Anyway, you have an economy of words you have a finite amount of time if you are seemingly running out the clock people are going to get annoyed and dreams but not everyone necessarily has access to the resources that can help them fuel those dreams and ambitions so when i talk about building an opportunity economy it is very much with the mind of investing in the ambitions and aspirations and the, and the incredible work ethic of the American people and creating opportunity for people, for example, to start a small business. Um, my mother, you know, worked long hours and our neighbor helped raise us. We used to call her, it was, I still call her, our second mother. She was a small business owner. I love our small business owners. I learned who they are from my childhood and she was i will once again ask the question who do you think what do you think is the larger number of voters in totality people who own small businesses people who want to start small businesses or people who work for small businesses or just work in general before you say oh this is for philadelphia that same principle holds in philadelphia as well okay pennsylvania is not like you know outside of the bounds of reality where there's just magically more small business owners and small business owners and and people who want to start small businesses than actual people who currently have issues with the economy okay not everyone can be a small business owner why don't they get that it's just silly wouldn't this be better if she framed it as supporting small businesses will create jobs and help employees make more money not necessarily true but wouldn't that sound better no what she should do is say we want to expand social safety nets in this country to help american workers who have for far too long been sold out by both parties okay this will also obviously improve the standing of small businesses and the american industrial force as a power player in the global economy because as my vice presidential candidate tim waltz coach waltz expertly showed in the beautiful state of minnesota when you pass with slim margins a bill that offers paid family leave small businesses also get to compete with big businesses that have generated a lot more revenue and can offer these amenities at ease this way small businesses no longer have to worry about certain health care costs or 
certain costs of operating the business in terms of their workers because we will take care of that. This is how you institute market reform and make the American economy more competitive overall. That way, you present a pro-working class message that literally expands to the broadest demographics. And on top of that, you present your argument in a way that also helps small businesses. But she's not doing that because her policy prescriptions are not actually focused on the broadest demographic of Americans. Americans who are wage laborers, okay? 1099 employees or W-2 employees, doesn't matter. Playing in imagination land? No, what I'm describing isn't some communist idea either, Comrade Perry. This is like super simple 1960s Democratic Party messaging, okay? This is just New Deal Democrat messaging, okay? If you are actually a New Deal Democrat, then this is what you would say. This is super basic. But we have, by way of third-way politics and Reaganomics and neoliberalism as a whole, completely gutted that aspect. I didn't make a bold declaration to just, like, undermine the, the entire capitalist uh, hegemonic status. I am simply saying you should expand on social safety nets. You shouldn't be afraid to push for social safety nets and expansion of social safety nets. And while you're doing that, you can present it as an argument that is also beneficial for small businesses because it is beneficial for small businesses. Interesting that that favorite centrist pollster blueprinty blueprint found that three worst messages from the Harris on the night were one, how great the border security bill was two, the tax deduction for small businesses and three, the vow to not ban fracking. I rest my case. Here is the empirical evidence to show exactly what I'm telling you. When I tell you when it's happening in the moment, it's a prediction. This is no longer a prediction. This is just a fact. Okay. I love our small businesses. My plan is to give $50,000 in tax deduction to start up small businesses knowing they're a part of the backbone of the American economy. 39% polling. I will not ban fracking. 31%. We need a president who actually brings up values in a perspective that is about lifting people up and not, people beating, uh, not beating people down. Great message. It's not policy, but it actually shows the clear-cut differences between Donald Trump and herself. Since I've been vice president, we have capped the cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000 a year. And when I am president, we will do that for all people. Healthcare should be a right and not just the privilege of those who can afford it. And the plan has to be to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, not get rid of it. 58%. Interesting. So when I yell from the rooftops about how you should at least talk about expanding Medicare to like, you know, Medicare eligibility to like 55 years old to capture an entire group of high propensity voters with a policy measure that isn't even bold at all, turns out not necessarily a bad thing. A, a community leader, she hired locally, she mentored. Our small businesses are so much a part of the fabric of our communities, not to mention Really, I think the backbone of America's economy. My opportunity economy plan includes giving startups a $50,000 tax deduction. Reminder, the question to her was bringing down prices, making life more affordable. What are the specific things you have in mind for that? Yeah, I gave you guys what I would answer in this situation if I was Kamala Harris. To start their small business. It used to be $5,000. Nobody can start a small business with $5,000. But investing in people's like she's still talking about small business i'm gonna f brian kill me dude holy sh ain't nobody cares about that man that's so dumb i can't believe that's your most prominent f economic policy it just seems out of place like look small businesses are great and all but our rent is expensive we can't even afford that how are we gonna start a business lamau thank you exactly 50k for startups is not a good policy man it sucks ass innovative ideas and giving them the ability to go for it um, opportunity economy, economy means, look, we don't have enough housing in America. We have a housing supply shortage. And what that means, in particular for so many younger Americans, the American dream is elusive. It's just actually not attainable. So part of my plan is to work with the private she should have cut all of this and literally started with the American dream, especially for young Americans is no longer a reality. Okay. It's elusive. It's no longer a reality. We need more houses so we can fix the goddamn housing market so that rent prices come down. The rent is too damn high. We don't have a housing supply shortage. Why is she lying? Oh, 
in high density urban areas, we do have a housing supply problem. Of course, across the board, when you look at the entirety of the United States of America, we do not. Okay. She's talking about places where people actually live. Now, of course, there are still places in even in high density urban areas where there's like still a bunch of empty apartments. That is also true. But that number dramatically decreases. That number dramatically decreases when you look at available housing units in a place like Los Angeles versus how many homeless people are there in comparison to Wyoming, which is not a real state. Any younger Americans? The American dream is elusive. It's just actually not attainable. So part of my plan is to work with the private sector and housing developers to give them. Yeah, I don't want to live in but Idaho. Sorry, chatter. Well, that's kind of funny you say that because like even in places like but Idaho or also known as Springfield, Ohio, when people do move in, they get real ass mad about it. They're like, oh, what oh, hey, oh, you mean hold on now? <laughs> hold on now. I didn't mean black people. I didn't mean like that. They're, they must be eating the dogs or something. I'm a tax credit to be able to partner with us as the government to build, and my goal is 3 million new homes by the end of my first term. In addition, to help people i also I hate this i want i want her to i want her to be like listen we're making a jobs program we're making a jobs program we got to build some goddamn houses okay i'm gonna put these motherfuckers work good high paying jobs so you can build some houses once and for all federal jobs program okay i'm opening up the money faucet and i'm giving mother money i'm giving you money Okay, you want to build a house? I'm going to give you money. Okay, I'm going to give you the money to make the house. Not 50000 to buy the house. I'm doing a federal jobs program. We're building housing units, 3 million of them. People who just want to get their foot in the door, literally. And so giving first-time home buyers a $25,000 down payment assistance to be able to just get in the door, and then they will do the work that they need to do to save and to pay that mortgage and to build wealth for themselves and their family. These are some examples of what I mean when I talk about an opportunity economy, and a lot of it has to do with just the community I was raised in and the people that I, you know, I admired who work hard, you know, and deserve to have, you know, their dreams fulfilled because they're prepared to work for it. She has still yet to talk about the $6 she's going to give every American taxpayer so they can avoid the top of the hour ad break, which is, in my opinion, kind of fucked up. I thought the Hassanabi voter block was a very important constituency of 28,000 voters in the state of Pennsylvania, specifically in Erie Township or Erie County, okay? And we are all undecided voters deciding whether or not we're going to vote for Kamala Harris or the couch, okay? And there has been no movement on this front at all. You talk at the debate and at previous appearances about turning the page mm -hmm. uh, on the past. And in fact, here today in Johnstown, you're talking about a new way forward. Yeah. I think some people have a question, given maybe your current role as vice president of the United mm -hmm. States, how different you are from Joe Biden. And so I wonder if there are one or two spots, policy areas or approaches where you would say, I'm a different person. Well, I'm obviously not Joe Biden. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I offer a new generation of leadership. And so, for example, thinking about developing and, and creating an opportunity economy where it's about investing in areas that really need a lot of work and maybe focusing on, again, the aspirations and the dreams, but also just recognizing that at this moment in time, some of the stuff we could take for granted years ago, we can't take for granted anymore. Um, for example, another um, plan that I have that is a new approach is to expand the child tax credit to $6,000 for young families for the first year of their child's life because that is obviously a very critical stage of development of a child and a lot of young parents need the help to buy a car seat or this is um this is actually a really really great graph that uh a chatter brought forward that actually kind of corresponds to the point i'm making in terms of like housing uh, availability like vacant units versus homelessness so if you look at like the top 20 cities where you have 
the highest ratio of vacant homes to people experiencing homelessness. Number one is Detroit. Number two is Syracuse, New York. Number three is St. Louis. Number four is Lakeland, Florida. Now, when you look at this ratio of available units to homelessness, okay, you immediately recognize, you immediately recognize one thing. With the exception of Chicago, Illinois, a lot of these places are places where like industry is left. There's still, there used to be life there. There used to be a city there. There used to actively be people living there, but it's no longer like a very uh, densely populated area. And there's still a ton of homelessness there, even though there is a lot of vacant properties. But when you recognize like places like Los Angeles, California don't have that same level of readily available housing in comparison to the number of homeless people, that is one, because there's a ton of homeless people and two, not as much readily available vacant housing. So this is why I always say this is a two-parter. There's certain aspects that people immediately cast aside as like nimbyism or whatever. That is true. There are vacant properties. There are far more vacant properties in this country than there are homeless people. But in terms of like high density urban areas, there needs to be more readily available housing units. That's where a lot of the homelessness happens. And a big part of the reason why there's a lot of homelessness there is a direct consequence of not having higher density housing available. Ultimately, though, this problem completely stems from treating every single homeowner, treating their house as not a, sh uh, as not a place for shelter, but instead a place for shelter and also an investment vehicle. Your house is your uh, asset that you can leverage against. Your house is what you purchase. You, you, your house is what you borrow money against. Okay. Your house is your nest egg. Your house is your retirement. Your house is the only way that you can generate generational wealth in this country. Okay. That is part of the reason why big businesses have been able to completely capture this marketplace, overtake it, and use many of the policies that have been implemented for years and years in an effort to make it easier to purchase a home and, and keep that home into a system that is fundamentally broken. That's why the idea for a lot of people is that like your value is never supposed to go down. It's all it's always supposed to go up. No one actually treats it like a investment. You get to you get to have your cake and eat it too. In the United States of America, you get to have your cake and eat it too. Your house is your place of shelter, but it's also your your uh, capacity to generate generational wealth. So all of a sudden, it's not just shelter, but it's also an investment vehicle. Uh, what do you mean? I purchased this house. If the price goes down, you're my bag. That is the problem. This is why I always say we have to decommodify housing. We have to decouple the idea that housing is a is a means of of generating income passive income because if we were to simply treat it as a as a mechanism for investment you'd go sucks to suck dog what do you mean like okay your value went down what what, what are we talking about here yeah you made you made a f uh, purchase you treated it like an investment and then your investment didn't pan out like that's the name of the game but of course you could never say that and win an election which is why i advocate for authoritarian measures that aren't necessarily authoritarian on principle, but would be treated as authoritarian by dumbass Americans. For example, if a law passes where you actually do move uh, towards decommodifying housing, you don't have to do town halls on it. If a law passes on a ballot measure, for example, for either rent control or, uh, I don't know, building new additional housing units or building a homeless shelter, and then you don't have to have town halls. Just do it. Eminent domain, baby. It's yours. Seize it. Take it. It's yours. Build on it. Get to work. What are we doing? What is this? The democracy part already happened. Why the would you have to go back after the democracy part already took place and then have to deal with some of the most schizophrenic Hitlerite suburbanites that don't want homeless people in the neighborhood? Sorry. Everybody else in the neighborhood voted for us. Suck my d You can call that authoritarian, but I call that actually doing democracy. Okay? crib or clothes for their kids and so my approach is about new ideas new policies that are directed at the current moment and also to be very honest with you my focus is very much in what we need to do over the next 10 20 years to catch up to the 21st century around again capacity but also challenges Crime and public safety are two major issues yeah. uh, right at the forefront of voters' minds in Philadelphia as well, where crime is a significant issue. When we talk about crime, the conversation turns to gun safety as well. And I think you actually probably caught a lot of people off 
Guard may be a bit by surprise in the debate the other night when you mentioned that you are a gun owner. I know you said it in 2019 as well. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your values on this yeah. issue. When it comes to gun ownership, we're... Okay, that was two for two, man. That was ass cheeks in terms of responding. Like, her answers were ass. This is not going to be good. This is not going to read well. Do you draw the line in America on gun ownership and gun use? Well, like you said, Brian, I am a gun owner, and Tim Walls, my running mate, is also a gun owner. We're not taking anybody's guns away. I support the Second Amendment, and I support reasonable gun safety laws. Part of my approach to this is I was a career prosecutor for most of my career. I have personally prosecuted homicide cases. I have personally looked at autopsies. I have personally seen what assault weapons do to the human body. And so I feel very strongly that it is consistent with the Second Amendment and your right to own a gun to also say we need an assault weapons ban. They're literally tools of war. They were literally designed to kill a lot of human beings quickly. I say we need universal background checks. The majority of NRA members support that. Why? Because it's just reasonable. You just might want to know before someone can buy a lethal weapon if they've been found by a court to be a danger to themselves or others. This is like probably the strongest she is on, on all three of the questions so far. Again, not enough Riz, but she's right. She just might want to know. Two final questions, if I might. Sure. On the appeal of the man you were running against, as you drove here today, you likely saw a lot of Trump signs. Mm -hmm. He has an historic appeal in this country. And as you are someone running against him and trying to understand that, I wonder how you distill it. What do you understand his appeal to be? And how do you speak to his voters, or maybe people who just share his values but are open to something else? I, based on experience and, uh, and a lived experience, know. In my heart, I know. In my soul, I know that the vast majority of us as Americans have so much more in common than what separates us. And I also believe that I am accurate in knowing that most Americans... Yeah, um, question for chatters in here that always are like, no, you don't understand, she's actually popping off on this, or no, you don't understand, she's actually popping off on that. Is she popping off on this for you? Not for, not for some, like, undecided mythical voter that you hallucinated that is going to be really responsive to the things that she's saying, but instead, does this, does any of this should appeal to you or anyone that you know? want a leader who brings us together as Americans and not someone who professes to be a leader who is trying to have us point our fingers. Honestly, yeah, she seems calm and normal and like she might try and do stuff. Still not swung to vote for her yet though because of Gaza. I love that. I, I put my Frank Luntz cap on for a second. I love when I hear from chatters who are like, listen, I like the vibes, okay? But also I don't like that she's facilitating a genocide so i'm probably not gonna vote for her but i like the vibes overall fingers at each other i think people are exhausted with that approach to be honest with you. i don't think the mythical voters are on the hassan i stream no of course not because they don't exist chatter that's what i'm saying remember what i told you every american voter and non-voter as well has like five immediate priorities and you can look at that list uh as a hierarchy of of need right every american has this every human has this right immediate priorities and if you want to capture the broadest segment of society you got to look at what their priorities are not by people who are responding to polls necessarily or like what issue do you think the democrats should be covering but like analyze the gr analyze what is happening in terms of like people's material conditions rent and cost of living is a massive priority for the broadest subsects of the american population okay if you honestly look at that recognize it prioritize it, put forward clear-cut policy prescriptions prescriptions to this issue, you will be able to capture the attention of a lot of people. You have to also obviously make them believe that you care about this. But that's it. Like politics is as simple or as difficult as you uh, make it. I think people want a leader who has common sense and tries to find common ground. I'm supported by over 200 Republicans who worked for both Presidents Bush, 
John McCain and Mitt Romney. I'm supported by the former Vice President Dick Cheney, Congress, former Congress member Liz Cheney. And I think people are more willing now, um, in light of the, the hate and division that we see coming out of Donald Trump, to say, hey, let's, let's put country first. And I think that just makes us stronger and more healthy as a country. To say, look, we will, we can all debate our differences around, you know, various policies, but let's stop with the division. Like enough of that. Let's bring everybody together. And finally, as you introduce yourself to America in a new way, they've heard much of your story at the Democratic National Convention and in that debate earlier this week. If there's one thing that you wish Americans knew about who Kamala Harris is that you don't think they know yet, Dog. what would that be? George W. Bush famously beat both Al, well, he didn't beat Al Gore, but you know, he stole the election from Al Gore and beat John Kerry in 2000 and in 2004. George W. Bush's vice president was Dick Cheney. The one state that George W. Bush didn't beat Al Gore or didn't beat John Kerry in, despite the fact that he actually won the election, was the state of, you might have guessed where I'm going with this, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, okay? Not Transylvania, Pennsylvania, okay? PA, you are talking to Philadelphians and Pennsylvanians, okay? That's who you're talking to with this conversation. Why are you bringing up an unfavorable person who doesn't even have a constituency in the Republican Party, but never won Pennsylvania anyway, even when he was the vice president? There is no good reason to invoke the name of Richard Cheney when you are trying to win Pennsylvania. Look to the issues that Pennsylvanian voters care about and try to win them over. Stop running to the bottom. Stop running scared. Stop imagining some weird like neoliberal centrist Pennsylvanian out there who's like, well, I really want a reasonable person who's going to bring back the war criminals of the past that I f despised and never really voted for. And I did vote for Donald Trump after I never really voted for George W. Bush. And also Donald Trump literally ran against George W. Bush and made Hillary Clinton look like George W. Bush. But actually, now I'm going to change my mind and vote for the person who George W. Bush's vice president, the demon himself, endorsed. Who is this for? Who? You might as well talk about Victor f Orban. At least I don't know who the f he is and he sounds like a like a villain from a comic book Who? Oh! why are they so stupid why why are they so stupid it's like 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 you want to win right you want to win right like you don't want to lose you want to win you want to win with like the narratives possible you want to win with the policies possible you want to win by pushing neoliberal uh policies fine but you still don't have to mention dick cheney endorsing you that's not like that's not a thing that's not a thing that voters care about the broadest majorities of the american population have recognized the iraq war as an abject failure okay that's the starting point people are either think it's an abject failure or their son got their blown off for dick cheney that's how they remember dick cheney as, as the guy responsible for why they only have a urn full of their son's ashes. That's what they know Dick Cheney as, the guy responsible for that. They don't know Dick Cheney as like some elder statesman that's like really reaching across the aisle. Like the, the f wrong with you? I don't know. I've been probably, it's not very different from anybody watching right now. I love my family. Um, one of my favorite things that I it, lately have not been able to do is Sunday family dinner. I love to cook. Um, I Chatters are like, bro, the donor class loves Dick Cheney. No, they don't. But even if they did, then say that behind closed doors at a $500,000 a plate dinner when you're doing a fundraiser, not at ABC6 Action News exclusive interview for Philadelphian voters. Oh my God. I have incredible friends. My best friend from kindergarten is still my best friend. Um... I think that, um, I mean, I have a career that really 
and I said it the other day, you know, as a I don't think mentioning Dick Cheney matters. When you have 11 minutes and 19 seconds to make your case in an exclusive interview to a local news station, specifically in the heartland of the state that you are trying to win, that you are most likely going to lose and then lose the election to Donald Trump on, you probably should be using your time wisely. Stop making excuses for democratic party operatives stop you are not paid by the dnc and if you are paid by the dnc you should listen to what i'm saying and then get that message across to the goddamn presidential candidate instead of chirping in here and trying to defend the advice you've given her if you actually are a staffer for the kamala harris campaign the career prosecutor i never asked a victim of crime were they a republican or a democrat the only thing I ever ask them is, are you okay? And I think that's the approach that most Americans want, regardless of who they voted for in the last election, um, in terms of turning the page and charting the way forward. I imagine you're looking forward to cooking Sunday dinner again. I am looking forward. I love, I, yes, I am looking forward to cooking. With the whole family gets involved, the kids each have their role. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful family, yeah. and we thank you for your time. Thank you. Pleasure thank meeting you. you. Thank, thank you, Brian. So She's not endorsing Dick Cheney. It's just a way to say that the establishment Republicans are deflecting for her. They hope it moves the needle. It doesn't, because it's not Dick Cheney's Republican Party. Dick Cheney, in his last moments in office, had a 13% approval rating. It wasn't even Dick Cheney's party when Dick Cheney was in office. So it doesn't matter. That's my argument. No one looks at this and goes, oh, wow, establishment Republicans are swinging for her. I guess I should, too. Y'all are crazy. I promise you Kamala Harris does not need you to defend her in this chat, okay? She doesn't.